Well, thanks for everybody for being here. And I like what you said, have fun, because that's um, what I like to do best. Uh, life is short. Um, so uh, there, are, there are basically two, two rules to live by, which is uh, have as much fun as possible, hurt as few people along the way. There's no third rule. Uh, part of having fun for me is cooking, and um, it has been since I was in fourth grade. I didn't start off to be a food writer, uh, and I resisted the f term food writer for a long time. Uh, I've got a new cookbook out called Romans 20, and the, the, the Montreal Gazette reviewed it this weekend and said, uh, called me food writer extraordinaire. Um, and I just found it kind of funny because it's not something I ever set out to do. Um, I set out to be a journalist. I set out to be a writer. I wanted to write, um, I wanted to write stories, nonfiction stories and fictional stories. I wanted to be a writer in sort of the old school way. <clears throat> and uh, I went to Duke University. I got a, a job out of New Duke uh, at the New York Times as a copy boy. Learned how to report a story, uh, how to write a story. Got some stories published. Um, newspaper writing was not for me. I wanted to write books. I was about books, I liked to read books, I was about books, that's what I wanted to write. And while I was at Nor uh, Northern Ohio Live magazine, I'd created a column for myself of cooking with chefs around town. I knew, I liked to cook myself, um, and I followed recipes, and I read books and read magazines, um, but I knew chefs knew something that I didn't know, and I wanted to know what they knew, because they didn't use recipes, they just cooked. So what do you need to do and know in order to, to cook? So I, I, co I, I interviewed these chefs and I cooked with them, and they all had gone, it seemed, to uh, one place, the Culinary Institute of America, and it's in the Hudson Valley, beautiful Hudson Valley, um, about seven miles north of New York. And so I thought, hey Donna, why don't I talk my way into the, Cul the Culinary Institute of America, dress up like a, a student, and watch, be a fly in the wall, do the work beside the students, um, and write a book about what it means to be a chef. Now our country was suddenly, they had this new, th they had this new network called the Food Network, um, and it had just come out. Uh, people were starting to become more and more interested in chefs and cooking. And I thought this would be a nifty idea. Plus, I'd have the added benefit of, of learning some nice tricks in the, uh, in, in the kitchen. Uh, and so I did. I finally talked my way into the, the CIA. We moved. We had a little daughter by then. We moved uh, uh, the family up to Tivoli, New York, nearby. It's always having a wonderful time. We go through three weeks. Of, you, make a, you learn to make a hollandaise sauce and emulsified butter sauce. Learn how to make a mayonnaise, you learn how to make stocks, turn those stocks into soup, how to clarify a stock for consomme. And um, it was all fun, it was cool and fun and easy. And so I um, went through the first three weeks, and at the end of the first three weeks, the end of the, that block of skills, we take a cooking practical where you have to come in and, for, as a test, in a certain amount of time, make a consomme, make a hollandaise, um, um, make a mayonnaise. Um, Basic stuff, make a roux, make a bechamel sauce, which is basically milk thickened with flour. That's all it is. And it's actually a really a cool little sauce once you know how to make it. Um, but as I was driving home that night, a blizzard had hit the, uh, hit the Hudson Valley really hard, the blizzard of 96. And by the time I got home, the night before the practical, I'd actually spun out on Route 9 coming home. Um, and it was, it was scary and hairy getting home, and I was lucky to get back home, I felt. And um, I looked out the window and the snow kept coming down and, and I got up the next morning and it had not stopped and the car was under, you know, a, a yard of snow and the whole Hudson Valley, everything was shut down. So I called up Michael Pardis, got him in his cubicle and said, uh, Chef, um, I'm, you know, I'd love to, I, you know, I'm, I'd love to be there, but obviously um, I'm not going to be able to take the practical today. He said, Okay. And I said, no, chef, this is important to me. I'm really committed to this book. Um, I really, I really want to be there. And he said, okay. He was not getting it. He did not understand. I want him to understand how much I wanted to be there. He said, I know, you know, you have your job. We have ours. I'm, I'm not saying you're, you know, I'm not saying it's bad. It's just different. We're different from you. We're cooks. We get there. So I hung up the phone, and I was pacing. And I told my wife what had just happened. And she, she assessed the situation. So he's basically calling you a wimp. <laughs> I said, yeah, 
Yeah, he is. He is. And I was seething. I was so mad. And finally it was clear what I had to do. And she said, Michael, don't even think about it. You are not driving 25 miles through a snowstorm to make a bechamel sauce. I drove 25 miles through a snowstorm to make a bechamel sauce. Um, I got there, and it changed my life. Um, I was still out there reporting. I was talking to chefs. Like I interviewed Michael Simon, and, I, you know, and, and a name kept coming up, Thomas Keller. Um, I asked Michael Simon, would he ever work for a chef? He had never really had a mentoring experience. Would he ever work, go work for a chef to learn? And he said, nope, I'd like being my own boss, running kitchens here in Cleveland. But if I did, it would be out with Thomas Keller at the French Laundry. First time I heard it, 1995. French Laundry had been open a year. French Laundry, what an interesting name. It stuck in my mind. And I kept hearing the name from other chefs, Thomas Keller, Thomas Keller. It's like, who is this guy? You know, people were calling him the monk out in Yountville. Um, so there I was in Cleveland, broke, trying to figure out what to do. No, I had to keep writing about this. I just started. I just, I just learned uh, how to be a cook. Uh, I had all the tools I needed. I needed to keep, keep writing about food, um, write about the work of professional cooking. There was something here at its core that I wanted to find, that I needed to find. Um, and when I was uh, talking with Michael Sonnen, who ran a popular restaurant in uh, Cleveland at the time, he said he'd gotten a stage with the famous New York chef, Jean-Georges Jean von Gerichten, uh, through Susie Heller, who lived in Cleveland, out in Sticks, actually, in Bainbridge. And she was a caterer, and she ran a restaurant. But she apparently knew all these chefs. Uh, and so I went out there. I had a um, catalog copy from The Making of a Chef that was going to come out, but wasn't going to be out for many months. I said, Susie, I'm a writer, but I've learned how to cook, and I want to learn how to cook more. And she was reading, reading this and reading my catalog copy, and I'd interviewed her, but we'd never really met. And she said, wow, you're in Cleveland. I didn't know you did all this. I'm working with Thomas Keller in his cookbook, and we're looking for a writer. It's like, you know, when they go into warp speed and, and Star Wars, everything just sort of changes, and I just sort of drilled my eyes onto her face. Um, I couldn't hear anything. I didn't have any senses. I just knew this, is what, uh, this was a, a remarkable, remarkable opportunity. She said, sure, get me, get me some chapters of your book. Um, I'll show them to the agent, Susan Lesher. I'll send Thomas the pages. Thomas. I'll send Thomas the pages. She called him by his first name. She knows him. Um, I said, great, great. And she was so sweet and optimistic and like, this will be really cool. She's, she's like that. Because he was looking for a real writer who didn't want a cookbook writer, who wanted a real writer. It's like, yeah, I'm a real writer. Book, not cooking. Um, and I left. I said, I got her that stuff. And I sent it to her. And she said, well, great. Well, I'm going out in a couple of weeks. We've got the stuff. And I'll give you a call. And so I got the call. Hi, Michael. It's Susie. You know, it's really too premature to be bringing you out to Yonville. I um, hope you understand. We'll be in touch. And I woke up the next day and was at my desk and trying to come up with a bread article for the PD, maybe make 25 or maybe 50 bucks. Um, and the phone rang and I picked it up. Hi, Michael, it's Susie. And that moment, it was like the, the clouds rolled off, the sun came out, the birds started chirping, rainbow appeared, because I knew there was only one reason she would be calling me. They talked it over, they wanted me out of the French laundry. She said she was going to drop, have Charlie drop off a ticket to me, and I'd be flying out to the French Laundry to have dinner the very next day. Uh, I'd gone from nearly bashing my head on a rock, poor, uh, 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 self-doubting, worried about my family, um, a nobody in the food world, nobody in the cooking world, being flown out to the French Laundry to have dinner at the greatest restaurant in the country, and talk with a chef who had just been, that spring, named the best chef in America uh, by the James Beard Foundation. All because I lived in Cleveland. It only happened because I lived in Cleveland. And it only happened because I said, I'm serious about this. I'm going to go learn to cook for real, and I'm going to go find somebody to help me. And I went out, and Susie helped me. But she didn't help me find a job in Cleveland. She helped me find a job in the Napa Valley. I went out there. I wrote that book with Thomas. and. Um, the French Laundry Cookbook, a $50 cookbook, a big monster celebrity chef coffee table cookbook, um, a book that is very difficult for cooks to cook from, let alone home cooks to cook from. 
because the recipes are so complex, um, has sold nearly half a million copies today. Uh, it is most chefs, it is on the list of most chefs' best cookbooks, and it did revolutionize the cook, cooking industry and, 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 and allowed Thomas to cast his knowledge uh, well beyond Napa. Um, working with him, though, was an extraordinary experience. He was Thomas Keller, and he became the great chef that he was because he was so aware. He, more than anybody, taught me to see in the kitchen. When he was a chef, young chef, 27 years old, cooking at La Rive, not far from Tivoli, where I was, uh, where I learned to cook, um, in the Hudson Valley, by himself, 27-year-old cook, did everything from appetizers to desserts, built a, himself a smokehouse and back. Um, he thought, he figured, well, if I'm going to cook rabbit, I should know how, I should know how to break down a rabbit. I should know how to skin, gut, and prepare a rabbit. That's what a chef does. That's what a chef should know. And he realized then how important it was to respect life. And if he was going to cook, that lab, rabbit was going to give his life for him. He was going to be the best rabbit cook ever. He was going to make that the best rabbit possible. He realized what a crime it is and how we all know, how all cooks know we've done it. We've forgotten about something in the oven. We burned it. There's nothing. We can't sell it. You've got to throw it away and fire another one. It's very easy to do that when it's come out of a cryovac package. But when you've killed a rabbit, you're going to make sure you use that rabbit really well. You're going to, you're going to bring your whole life to glorify that rabbit. And then he did one more thing beyond just recognizing this fact. He translated this recognition, this knowledge, into everything else that he did. So he realized that even burning the croutons was a waste. Now, it wasn't, of course, the waste of the, of the life of the, the wheat, but it was the, a waste of the life of the farmer who grew the wheat and of the baker who baked the bread uh, and the cook who cut the croutons for him to roast. It was important not to waste anything. And that is what Thomas taught me. And it's why I don't think I need to apologize when I say I write about food and cooking. Because it's not about pleasing ourselves or, or saving ourselves. Or, or It's not a luxury. Um, it's fundamental to our humanity. Because that's where it all began for me. Thank you.